This is Q on CBC Radio 1 across Canada, Sirius 137 across North America and internationally at cbc.ca. Well, looking back over the past 20 years, you'd be hard-pressed to find a Canadian novel with the cultural impact of Douglas Copeland's 1991 debut, Generation X, Tales for an Accelerated Culture. The book, which explored the fears and realities of the first post-baby boom generation, struck a chord with both readers and cultural critics, and Douglas Copeland was quickly dubbed the voice of a generation. Praise like that can be damning, but to his credit, he didn't swerve. He continued to create in entirely new directions. These days, if not the voice of a generation, Douglas Copeland is definitely one of our most observant and prescient writers, and a singular sensibility in other art forms as well. He's just released his 13th novel, a work of speculative fiction, boldly and perhaps a little cheekily, titled Generation A. The characters in Generation A live in a not-too-distant dystopian future, one in which bees have gone extinct and where celebrity culture and technological advances dominate our lives in disturbing ways all too easy to imagine. Douglas Copeland joins me live in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Gian, hello. Nice Very to nice be here. to have you here. Thank you. Long time yeah. coming. We've done interviews, but not in this studio. No, we've always been in sort of ad hoc situations, haven't we've we? We've been off campus. Yeah. <laughs> but here, I, I like the sort of... Uh, it's, um, like the, the banners around the room here, it's, it's like we're in England and there's the Q Festival going on or something. It's a medieval that's looking. That's what we like to think. It's a bit of a Q Festival. Douglas, we know what Generation X is, or at least we think we know what it is. Uh, what is, or perhaps more accurately, what will be Generation A? Yeah, well, first of all, going back to Gen X, that came out in March 91. And back then, I wish, you know, does it even exist, Generation X? Is it, if you have to assign a, a psychographic to it, you know, did you like the talking heads? You know, if so, you're X. It's like that simple. <laughs> uh, generation A, however, it's, it's a negation of uh, generations. The, the title comes from a, a, a Kurt Vonnegut was giving a 1994, I think, a Syracuse University in the States uh, a c- commencement speech. And, and, uh, and I don't have the book in front of me, but it says, like, okay, well, I hear you, you twerps are being called Generation X now, and that's not doing you much of a favor, you know, being at the end of the alphabet, nothing to look forward to. I hereby christen you Generation A. <laughs> and I read that, and I was like, thank you, A, for, like, uh, sort of negating all the silliness about X, <coughs> and B, creating something so wonderful. So didn't Kurt Vonnegut say Generation A because uh, he was saying this is a new beginning, that you're, you're the future, and so why not start yeah. at A? yeah. I thought that was really lovely. And I mean, it's been 18 years of nonsense with that. But then, then, but then this is an interesting decision for you. So why, why call your book? Why engage in something so loaded and self-referential as, uh, as to call your book Generation A? Are you taking the piss? Well, it's kind of um, a little bit. I mean, how many times have you and I talked over the years and like, please don't mention Generation X? Right. Because I've been trying to establish some sort of identity away from that. And like, I think at this point I've done it. And so now it's like finally, okay, the final silver nail in the thorax of the zombie that will not die or whatever. Right? And even if it never does die, I've dealt with it. Right. You've added it and, and dealt with it very publicly. You know, having said this, there are similarities between the novels. The common theme of storytelling, for instance, the world of Generation A is highly technological, yet it's telling stories, and that helps the characters find the greater truths of their lives. Do you think that we're losing our ability uh, to tell stories? I don't know if it's so much storytelling, if it is as much figuring out if your own life is a story. I think that uh, when the novel became popular, especially in the 19th century, uh, people began to read them. They had nothing else to do, literally. There was like the only other high technology they had were windows and stairs. I mean, so you had books, so people would read books. And it created a sense of individuality in the reader. And it also, it made people think, well, what if my life's a story? And like, you take someone who died young, and we were just talking about Kurt Cobain before the show was on here, and you know, he was born, he had this big story, and then it ended with his death. Right. And a lot of us, your story's over long before you die. Uh, but we're very sentimental about, like, what's the story of my life? And I think we're kind of losing that. 
uh, we're no longer concerned about what the big arc is in your life. Now it's like, how many hits do you get? Well, we're documenting our lives, though, more than we ever have, right? Think of yeah. the teen that has a million photos of themselves, <laughs> or at least thousands and thousands because of the access from a digital camera. Yeah. You know, so... So is it that we don't have the big story, but we've got the little stories that the, the arc is covered by quick hits? Well, what's happening now, uh, you have these optical recognition technologies, and Google's using it, for example, for its Google Books project. And like you, in, you, you, the iPhone's already got one that works for Sudoku, where you point it at Sudoku in the paper, it reconfigures it as a digital file, and it, and it solves it for you, it's, which is kind of voodoo you know, by my standards. But... And very quickly, within two years, you're going to be able to get scan scanner apps or scanners themselves, and you can be in a restaurant, and you'll point it at the menu, you can point it at your friend's tattoo, you can point it at, you know, a billboard, and everything we write is going to be put into the per permanent memory somewhere. For what purpose, though? For why? And, uh, and not only that, there's another program by who else? I believe it's Google where if you leave the microphone on in your computer mm. throughout the day, if it picks up anything that it thinks could be transcribed into a text file, it does so. And so then you said, like, literally everything is in a data bank. Everything's recorded. Everything. And that's spooky. And that's got to change your sense of who you are and why you are. I mean, look, I'm addicted to email. Like, how many times have you had people say, like, I'm going on a holiday, I'm not picking up email. And, like, not even... 48 hours later, they've crumbled and they've gone to the local, right, right. you know, uh, right. coffee bar. Um, it is different to be alive in 2009 than it was 20 years but ago. But what does that mean for storytelling? I mean, the, when it when, when if you say the word storytelling to me, that, that implies communication to me. That implies one person speaking or communicating, another person listening or reading or consuming it somehow. Mm -hmm. All of these devices, you're, you're talking about new technology, and of yeah. course... You know, you have been branded somewhat of a, a guru around this stuff, at least the near future and what we're what we're to expect. All of these technologies, it, it occurs to me, are uh, sold to us uh, on the premise that we're we're communicating better with each other than we ever have before. And so one would think mm -hmm. that that would work for storytelling. And, and yet at the same time, it seems uh, counterintuitive that all of this stuff means less intimate connection with each other. Well, here's something. Uh, in Generation X and Generation A, you have a group of people who go off to a remote place uh, and they're telling stories to each other. And it is loosely structured on an old novel from Italy called The Decameron, where there's a plague in Milan and a group of young people go off to a castle and they kill the time by telling stories. And what happens in this book, and to a lesser extent in Generation X, is that as the characters tell their stories, certain themes keep emerging and re-emerging. Right. And, and then you only by uh, telling stories, then doing pattern recognition amongst the group of them, you can say, oh, they're very much concerned about the death of the interior voice in your head that you or I use every day. Like, oh, they're very concerned about how the act of reading actually changes the brain. And, and these people, I mean, it's in the indefinite future, I'd say maybe 10 years-ish. And they're just that much further down. I mean, God knows what technologies we're going to get tomorrow or the week after. And they're doing, uh, reassessing the degree to which, how to be an individual, maybe that's perhaps it, mm. uh, is that we fetishize individuality in our culture. We might we romanticize it, you know, it might have been a byproduct of technology that's on the way out. And like, I'm not some big cheerleader about technology. I, I've, you know, some of it's good, some of it's in, but, but I do like the present and I do like new ideas and seeing how ideas get disseminated. And I think we are sort of leaving the era of copyright, leaving the era of the individuality mm. and entering some new, you know, I, you know, bees are fact factored in the book, the hive mind or the right. collective mind. You, let me stop you. There's a bunch of things you've said there that I want to pick up on. 
uh, the uh, this is what it's like talking to you. I'm just remembering now <laughs> that in your answer, there's so many things that I want to pick up on that uh, inevitably I don't get to. But I want to come back to reading and I want to come back to the inside voice. But let me stick with technology for a second. When you say you're not a cheerleader for technology, you seem to have an interesting relationship with it. You just told me a, a couple of minutes ago here that, that you're addicted to emailing. I know you Twitter quite often. So um, so do and, you. Yes, well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. And now, and, but you also seem to have had a skepticism about technology. What What is your, how would you describe your, your relationship with, with new technology? Well, my concern with technology is uh, sort of the medium is the message and how it does, it restructures your brain. It, it's like getting a new operating system installed. And my concern is time. To do what I do, you have to have time. Uh, and you have to have a certain degree of focus uh, every day and when something new like I've never done Facebook I've never been, done MySpace because somehow there's something about those technologies that corrodes time whereas Twitter is great because you know once or twice a day something happens which has no other logical place in the universe and it goes there and you think it's silly made for Twitter you know you think it's silly and dominant it's like the world's worst name Twitter what were they thinking <laughs> but then like boom the Iranian elections come around and suddenly it's not just like a hula hoop anymore. Right. It's this really amazing technology. Um, I think that I, I'm, a lot of this stuff is good. What and do you think the dark side is of our interconnectivity? Well, the dark side is um, I was flying to England a few weeks ago and I had two really worthy novels in my carry-on luggage and instead I watched season five of Entourage on DVD <laughs> And that's like six hours of reading I'm never going to get back. And, you know, I'm as guilty of it as anyone. Like, there are... It becomes a distraction. It's not, Well, it's, it was, you know, it's well-crafted TV. It was kind of nice. But there are too many distractions. And you really, really have to be uh, brutal on how you, you stretch your time. Dave Eggers down in California, the American writer, uh, he just does his email twice a day. And he doesn't have... He has to go to, like, a local cafe to do it. And, and he knows people know that. So if people send a long email demanding a detailed answer, it's like, sorry, not my lifestyle. Click, gone. Uh, as a corollary, I have often kind of one, like, wonder if we had to do what we're all doing now in society using just telephones and mail and maybe FedEx, which is basically life in 1990, you know, we'd collapse. I mean, we're so, we do so much now. We all, Hyperachieve every day. But what's happening when you're tweeting? Then are you uh, are you putting something off? Are you distracting yourself from something that you'd rather be doing? Uh, um, and why can't you stop it then? Okay, here's an example. Like at Heathrow, coming back from that trip to England, uh, putting my luggage on the, the this, where they put it off the conveyor belt or whatever. Uh, I broke my center fingernail in a way. It's like ah, like split right down the middle and just like like it was very painful. Right. But I'm inside security at this point, and I'm sure they're not going to be selling scissors inside the security area at Heathrow. It's so like, okay. So on the hunch, there's this guy over the security guy. And he said, look, I screwed up my fingernail here. Do you have, like, a pair of confiscated clippers? And he's like, hmm. <laughs> and he goes over, and he brings this, like, Rubbermaid bucket <laughs> full of, like, thousands of confiscated nail clippers. He's like, oh, this one here looks clean. And, like, okay, it's a risk of getting cooties from using, like, but it was, like, better... Uh, uh, and a moment like that, where does that go? It's funny, it's wonderful, and it's never going to be in a book. Or it's, you don't want to, like, dear mom and dad, a funny thing happened today. <laughs> so you just put it out on Twitter, and it's out there, and it maybe brings a bit of a, you know, like a comic strip or something, brings a smile. It's really interesting. I, I've never heard it described this way, that the, a Twitter is an outlet for moments that have no other place. We haven't created another place to, to describe, although you could mm -hmm. weave that into a short story. I mean, I know, I mean, I've, I've, I've Twittered, I do, I do haikus, um, about like the service at Holt Renfrew, uh, like foolishly making fried chicken on the hottest day of the year, and it it, it just it's just life. It, it it's it's not a diary, and it doesn't overtake your life in the way that blogging does, for example. In the world of Generation A, it seems that everything we do, listening to music, reading a book, even recognizing a brand or a celebrity, changes the body on a minute physical scale. Can you explain that view that daily experiences change our, change our physical selves? Well, I will. Um, I was very lucky to be able to write a, a 
biography of Marshall McLuhan, which is finished now, and it comes out from Penguin next March. And I've never done a biography before. It's like, how do you approach a person? And the thing about Marshall McLuhan, younger people may not recognize his name. He, like, the medium is the message, uh, the global village. That was his sort of his brand, so to speak. He was an incredibly intelligent guy. His brain was a disaster. He, was, he had blood vessels going to strange locations. He had many strokes. People in his family tended to die of strokes. And I found that so much of who he was and what he, what he spoke about was based purely on the structure of his brain and that he was the one who actually came up with a sense of the medium as the message, which is a way of saying that uh, what you, the way you take in information, the way you experience the world subtly and over the period of time, and sometimes like with email, which has completely colonized most people's lives very quickly, it changes the way your brain is literally wired. And it, you, we're taught that the brain never grows, but that's actually not true. Yeah, I think you get about 40,000 new brain cells a day in your neocortex, and they're on the outside level. But if you don't actually use them, make new connections, new associations, then they vanish, they, they dissolve or something. And so, so there's a lot to be said for like A, the brain grows, B, you can train it to grow in certain ways, and C, that's kind of cool. Like, you know, experiment, do something with that. One of the key devices in Generation A is a drug called Solon. Is that how I would say it? Solon. Solon. And that makes time seem to move quicker. What inspired you to create this fictional drug? Well, assuming it's still fictional. Well, my, my, my father's a doctor, and I sort of grew up around pills, and I've always sort of wondered, what can a pill do to change you? And what if you're in jail? So if you could take a pill to make time go more quickly, hmm. and jail time doesn't serve, it doesn't feel so long. And, or if you're in a really good patch of life, you take a pill that sort of slows it down a bit, allows you to enjoy it some more. And with Solon, it's not so much about time as it's this pill you take, and it mimics the sensation that you would get in your brain if you were living, say, the 1930s, and you just read 10 really good classical novels in a row, giving you that sort of, that sort of sense of, a very single focus sense, and a sense of sort of quiet in the brain, and uh, that sense of individuality that led to things like uh, the middle classes, or industrialism, or science, or sort of secular culture in general. Um, so Solon is a pill you take it, and but you're never quite sure. You get people get addicted to it the moment you take but it. I thought you take it for boredom. Well, what you do is you take it, and you don't mean you don't mind being by yourself. Mm. It, it also incidentally you become reclusive. You, you don't need people. You're no longer a dog. You're a cat, and you can take people or leave them. Mm. And and that to me was like, you have, you, have, you have a situation in the future where everyone's kind of like scattered and fragmented. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. They're just, that's the way individuality and the notion of being a person's going. And suddenly you have these people like, who like, boom, they're like a hundred year throwback to the, the, to the long winter in the 2000 page novel, like Buddenbrooks or something like that. And they're, they're like freaks. And it's very disruptive to the economy. It's very disruptive to the social fabric. And then uh, you have a group of people who, it's a complex set of situations. They they've got some sort of antidote to it. And is that, does that make them valuable? Does that make them a threat? Does that where does that put them? And I won't see what happens at the end of the book. But you're, I hope the reader is left with a sense of like, okay, where's this all going? Um, some people say it's kind of. A depressing ending. Yes, yeah, someone said it was really happy and optimistic yesterday. So, you know, Shakuna uh, hmm. uh But it, let me just stick with Solon for a second. So, because uh, I'm, 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 still, I'm a little confused. I thought I knew what it was, but now you've. Uh, so, uh, so it makes time go faster. So, uh, to put this very uh, simply, if um, it, with the, the prison metaphor, if if you're in a situation that you want, you don't want to be in, or or if you're bored, if you're suffering uh, from. Uh, paralyzing ennui, you take so long and, and life moves faster, uh, albeit, uh, and, and you're comfortable with yourself. Not, right? so, not so much ennui, but loneliness. Loneliness. Yeah. So if so long was real, would you be tempted to take it? Mm, that's a good question. Um, now, I'm pretty happy with the pace of life right now. Um, I don't 
think so, but you know, I'm in a good patch right now. You know, ask me when I'm in a bad patch. Ask anyone if they're in a bad patch. You'll do anything to get out of it. Um, Is there a cultural equivalent to Solon at work today? Probably. Um, <clears throat> books. Hmm. Reading books, I think. Um, and sorry, I took that long to get that answer, but I think that's that's where it comes from. By the way, there's this real drug now, it's called modafinil, and it's like the Harvard drug, because all these kids, I say kids, like, like 18 to 22, they're in university, and you take it, and it gives you super concentration. Have you heard of this? The New Yorker did a big article well, I thought on that. that was called coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's this weird new, it's like this like achievement drug, you take it and it makes you achieve, and this, that's for real, and... Of course, like, I want that right away. You're asking me if I'd take Solon. I don't know, but I certainly want this. Other drugs, but, so I, I go to my doctor, he tells it, like, okay, you take it and it allows you to focus, but sometimes it can backfire because instead of being able to concentrate on algebra, it, maybe you might get a song in your head like Louie Louie and you won't be able to get out of your head for 24 hours so it can backfire that way. <laughs> but I love your answer uh, that the co cultural equivalent might be books and this, let's bring this back to what you were talking about reading. I mean, you're a writer and that's solitary work but I wonder based on what you're saying is reading an act activity that allows solitude and connectedness back to that storytelling to oh, exist? Absolutely. You know, if, if in doubt most people, you know, uh, Let's see, many, many people can't fall asleep at night unless they read a bit of fiction. And that's absolutely me. It doesn't matter if it's one page or 20 pages or like a big chunk of a book. Because um, when you read someone else's book, you turn off your own internal, that sense of you that's always like searching, looking, looking, worrying, thinking, whatever. That goes away and someone else comes in and hijacks your system for a few pages. And in doing so, it turns off something in your brain that allows you to, to fall asleep and be more relaxed. Nonfiction won't do it. And for me, anything that involves the third dimension, like doing blueprints for a room or making something, I'll be up for five hours. Hmm. Douglas, do you think that, uh, I mean, while people are lamenting the the end of reading or the fact that, they're, 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 you know, that's this presumption that younger gener gener generations read less. It also strikes me to come back to and weave the technology into here that all of these devices or, or uh, social networking models, uh, whether it be Facebook or, or Twitter or texting, involve reading. Yep. Uh, is there a difference between reading a series of, t of Twitter messages and reading a novel in terms of how it enriches us? Oh, I think that they're very different. I mean... At the same time, I say, like, your twits are really good, so I read them. Some people don't do good twits, so it's like, it's kind of a waste of time. But it's like any medium done well is fascinating. And, um, but they do affect the brain differently. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, why is nobody saying, this is great, kids are reading? <laughs> well, uh, well, language is mutating. I like the way that, I'm sure you've talked about it many times before, the way people just sort of collapse the language into these sort of blips and beeps now. It's um, usually talked about as a bad thing. It's usually well, put in the context of, oh, God, look what's happened to our language. Just look at the way kids are talking to each other in, in text messages. Well, okay, I remember back in the, ooh, the days before all this technology when people wrote letter letters. And nowadays, if someone writes you a letter, you think, oh, God, like, they changed their meds or something. Like, <laughs> what's this about? Uh, and... Now, when people write emails, they write their blogs, and you read them, people are writing they're more creative, they're more the individuality, what you're talking about. Their, their sense of self comes through. It, it's kind of, in a lot of ways, a golden age of writing. And I don't... I mean, all the kids that grew up with pagers and beepers and buzzers, and they're all in their mid-20s, late-20s now, and they, they seem to be... They seem to come out of it okay. Um, so I don't worry about that. You talked about uh, earlier, you mentioned the inside voice. The main characters in Generation A agree that the voice they hear in their heads when they read is not their own. Yep. It's a network news broadcaster. What voice do you hear when you read? In a weird way, I know I don't want to freak out, but it's kind of you, actually. <laughs> and you, um, you hear my voice when you read. Pretty much. They're... Uh, the reason, the metaphor I use is the Channel 3 news team. And news broadcasters aren't chosen not just for the sort of bland, you know, blandly attractive looks. Uh, 
you try and hire a newscaster who has a voice that is sort of broad enough to encompass a broad, uh, large swath of people mm. that doesn't conflict with the inner voice of their head so that when you turn on the news, there's a reassurance you get from it. But it's kind of like what, what you hear already. And uh, you have like... An oh, so you're using me as a metaphor. I, you, I, th- I got well, excited. No, well, I thought you were actually talking well, about no, Actually, the, the thing is... <laughs> it, it, this is so embarrassing. It's like, it kind of is you. <laughs> and because I've just met you, know, know you over the years. Now, obviously, I listen to your show. And uh, uh, so there you go. You, know, you never know you're changing people, but you are. So what, what is that voice doing when you're reading? Am I reading? <sighs> well, here, here, I'm sitting in a chair. You're there. And like, I'm talking right now. But where the hell am I getting these words from? Is there like this big sort of rack of words and I'm pulling them down? No. They seem to be coming from somewhere quite easily. And and you're doing the same thing. And, and if you're driving your car right now and listening to this, it's like, okay, I'm going to stop for a second. And then something was filling the blank you just heard. What was that? Mm-hmm. The voice you hear with and the voice that you speak with, they're coming from two different locations in the brain. There's got to be some science behind this. Uh, but when, as I say, called the Channel 3 News Team, it's this group of news reporters they are getting... <laughs> assassinated or killed and very bad things happened to them in the book and the only thing that ever changed this was I went to see Margaret Drabble she's a British author mm-hmm. in 1982 or 83 she was in Vancouver and she opened her mouth and began reading the book I think it was called The Radiant Way that year that was her book and I wish I hadn't gone because now with the exception of Margaret Drabble's book I hear her voice um I don't know if I'm doing myself a service by being here and planting my voice in the listener's brain. Mm. You know, I, I think it's best that you read a book with a voice that hasn't hijacked you, uh, that you use your own interior voice. All quest- also, people in England don't necessarily have English accents in their head. <laughs> it's a very strange thing, and no one studies it. But we might have English accents in our head, even though if we don't speak that way. Well, I know, I mean... I mean, my yeah. my inside voice is Jarvis Cocker. He just, no, really? No, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> you got excited though, right? Well, no, it's like because you'd be like, you, I don't, it'd be an interesting. But, 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 but I, I don't want to go in the Jarvis Cocker direction. Like, he's very funny, but that's like, it's too random. You you seem to have a very rich and creative life. You're not only a successful writer, but also a renowned visual artist, furniture designer. There's an idea in this book, in Generation A, it occurs to me, about our lives being stories and how we're always searching for that defining moment in them. Do you have a Mm. defining moment? Oh, let's see. There's a few. Other than this interview, of course. Uh, Quitting smoking. And that was Halloween 88, so it's 21 years ago almost. And I was actually living in Toronto at the time, and it was at the Halloween party, and it was really hot that night. And then four hours later, coming into the party, it just went below zero. And my Halloween costume was a Charlie Brown ghost. So it was like <laughs> a sheet with like two holes cut out of it, and it had no thermal properties, and I had no money, and there was no cabs or anything. Wait a minute, a Charlie Brown ghost? Yeah. You know, you, why isn't that just a ghost? Well, I think it's in the old cartoons, like, it's just like oh, the, I see, I see. It's like the world's most right, lame, right, I see, the world's right. lamest costume. <laughs> right, okay. And so I had to walk like about I think it was like two and something miles home in like the freezing weather, and I knew I was could not wake up in the morning in a good shape. And I had this one last cigarette, and like oh, I think this is actually the last one. And I put it out in the morning. Woke up like I'm dead, and that was it for smoking. And I, I framed it actually in the ashtray. I was very proud of it. Um, that was a real before and after point in my life. Um, in terms of like the, the magic, there was in uh, Davisville subway station also in Toronto. Uh, it was, I think it was March 89. And I had just come out of the Golden Griddle restaurant, which I think is still there. Mm-hmm. And it was later in the afternoon and just it had been a massive rainstorm and the rain had stopped and the clouds were coming in. The sun was coming through the clouds in the west and the sky was kind of orange and kind of like the, the, the red here in the letters. And it was like, Doug, stop. And I stopped. If you're going to write, you have to write fiction. Okay? And and you have to give up a lot of things in your life. Your 
going to have to just, you know, eat more oatmeal and hot dogs for a while. Okay. And then it left. And when like, was that? Why was that? When? That was, uh, I, I'm guessing March. I could look it up from my old. Of what year? Well, it was, I was working on uh, 89. Let's see. So just your before, defining uh, moments all happened uh, in right in the late '80s before Generation X comes out a couple of years later. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, I still don't know what that voice was and where it came from, and but it was very definite. And and since that moment, if people say they hear voices or like someone else is directing me, I, I don't discredit it. And I, this thing does exist it might be what we consider our, ourself is just this one electrical blast that's going around your brain in whatever direction and sometimes you might get another like like temporary one that comes in and, and that could be the roots of schizophrenia for all we know the book is called generation a uh, a most engaging book uh, uh, which I, I, I started in various parts of Europe and ended here so I feel like I've, I've experienced it on various continents uh, and and very positively so um, as we end off maybe I'll try and weave together a few things that we've uh, walked through in this interview we started by talking about generation X and uh, your beginnings and, and trying and the fact that you you can't much like a, um, a hit song written on the first album you can't shake it for the rest of your your career or something uh, and, and so uh, you've you've decided to almost send it up um, and we also mentioned Kurt Cobain and uh, you were telling me before uh, just as we were coming to air here that uh, that uh, you were at that unplugged, unplugged. MTV unplugged it's Sony with, Studios with Nirvana on 10th Street. Yeah. and you were I'm assuming I'm doing the math in my head so Generation X, X comes out in 91 that was 93 I think so you were pro- probably partly there because post Generation X you've been an it boy You've been uh, a, a, a kind of person that people want at their definitive Nirvana gig. You just rolled your eyes, and that's why I'm asking you this well, question. It no, it was I more, wonder. It was, it was more like a. Hmm, okay. <laughs> well, I wonder because my presumption would, if if I were to say to you, where are you at on your journey now, and how do you feel about still being in it, boy? I would assume that you might come back with something modest, like, well, I I I've never liked that. I don't know how I feel about that. But I wonder if there's something addictive about it, and if there's something that. Uh, you continue to like to feed about being an it boy. Oh, oh, like, um, I don't know how do I don't I think I stopped being it a while ago. But I'm flattered to think you, there's some itness to my being. Um, publicity or press can be addictive. Um, I'm not an easy interview. I, I don't like. I'm notorious for being crabby about interviews and stuff. And uh, I can sometimes you see those young stars and starlets out there, and I can just tell when they've got addicted to press. And you know, someone in their life should just take them and shake them and say, "You got to stop. This is not good. It, it goes nowhere. Uh, there's nothing good can come of it." Uh, if if I could do what I do with zero press, although I'm sure my publicist would freak, <laughs> I would I would do it no press at all if I could get away with it. Um, it's just sort of part of the job description. So, um, no, uh, no, no. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> the answer is no. You don't want to be. No. Um, too bad we're out of time. This is. I've only ever done one interview in my life, and that was with Morrissey, and that was in Rome, back in two thousand six. You mean as the interviewer? As the interviewer, mm. and it was an awful awful position to be in and i don't know how you can do it for a living they can't pay you enough money and it's a hell of a lot of work and uh, the thing about that interview was i'd taken so many this new magic generation of sleeping pills that when it, the time finally came i walked in and i blacked out and like six hours later i was talking to my agent on the phone and like what the hell just happened and oh my god i did and i scrambled went looking for my notes and there's like a daisy on a sheet. <laughs> like, oh God, what have I done? And uh, so, did you do the interview? Well, I did it, and I remember very few things. And it was kind of like looking in an empty fridge and still managing to make an okay omelet. And so, if, Morrissey, if you're out there, I apologize. I don't know what I talk to you about. I, I blame that drug. 
Douglas Copeland, it's a, as ever a pleasure to speak to you. Thanks for making the time, even with your antipathy for doing press. I would hope that you'll still come here since I'm the voice in your head anyway. You, you'll make an exception. Absolutely. No, I love doing your show. <laughs> you know, always, always have. Good to have you here. Thanks, sir. Thank you. That's Douglas Copeland. His latest novel is entitled Generation A, available from Random House Books, and he joined me live in Studio Q.